Thank you for coming to the last session of this mini course. Let me first share with you the files in the chat and also mm, Yes, so let's start. Mm. <clears throat> Here is where we were uh, on Monday. So let's start with the gluing formula. The idea of the gluing formula is as follows. Uh, roughly, the gluing formula states that we can glue two open curves along two opposite boundary components and form a bigger concatenated curve like this. Then the count of the concatenated curve should be the product of the counts of the two initial curves by this formula. So this is more convincing evidence that our counts really re reflect open curve counting. It is also an essential ingredient in the proof of the associativity of the mirror algebra. Now, let's establish this gluing formula in three steps. Step one, given two spines, S1, and S2 in the essential skeleton of U, assume we have an infinite one valent vertex W1 and an internal infinite one valent vertex, meaning that it's mapped to the essential skeleton instead of to the boundary. So assume we have such a vertex W1 in S1 and respectively, we have an internal infinite one valent vertex W2 in S2, such that the two uh, vertices map to the same point in the essential skeleton, SKU. Next, we consider a spine delta with three infinite one valent vertices, W1, W2, W, and the mapping constantly to this point where, w, where the previous W1 and the W2 uh, go. So we consider this spine, which maps constantly to the same point. And this spine has just one three valent vertex and three infinite legs. So we can glue this constant spine delta to S1 and S2 along W1 and the W2 and form a new spine S like this in the essential skeleton of U. Here, uh, the infinite one valent vertices W1 and the W2, they become node, nodes in the new spine after we glue. So in the new spine, this is an infinite edge containing a node and this is another infinite edge containing a node. Now we have the following lemma. For any curve class gamma, we have uh, the following equality, that is the count associated to the span S and the curve class gamma by evaluating at uh, this internal marked point W is equal to the sum over all decompositions of gamma into gamma one plus gamma two of the count associated to uh, the spine S1, uh, this spine S1, uh, curve class gamma one times uh, the count associated to the spine S2 uh, curve class gamma two. So for S1, we, we evaluate at the point W1 and for S2, we evaluate at the point W2. So this is the formula we have uh, for the count of the 
glued span. Uh, since this part is constant, it doesn't contribute. Um, the proof is not difficult. By passing to a big enough base field extension, this follows from a set theoretical decomposition of the set of skeletal curves associated to S uh, of the left-hand side to products of sets of skeletal curves associated to S1 and S2 respectively. So after big enough base field extension, it reduces just to a set theoretical equality. One can just check by hand. So this is the first step of gluing. We glue uh, two spines with this auxiliary span uh, at these infinite vertices. Now let's consider second step of gluing. So in the second step, we are given two spines, S1, uh, S2, in the essential skeleton of U, both transverse to walls. And assume we have a point P1 in gamma 1, the domain of S1, and P2 in gamma 2, the domain of S2, uh, both in the interior of some edge. And we assume that they map to the same point in the essential skeleton, and also they do not meet wall. Uh, since they map to the same point, we can glue, so we can glue S1 and S2 along the points P1 and P2 and obtain a new transverse span S in the essential skeleton of U, like this. We just glue this these two together at the point P1 and P2. Then we have a similar <coughs> uh, lemma saying that for any curve class gamma, uh, we have the following equality, which says that the count associated to the glued span S and any curve class gamma is equal to the sum over all decompositions of gamma into gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of the count associated to the first span S1 and the curve class gamma 1 times the count associated to the second span S2 and the curve class gamma 2. Mm. Here is the proof uh, for this mm for this equality. So for the proof, uh, we add an infinite leg W to S at P. Because uh, if you recall that uh, in our definition of counts, we always need some internal, internal uh, marked point in order to evaluate. And uh, we proved using skeletal curves, we proved uh, a symmetry theorem seeing that the place where we evaluate eventually does not matter. But for the just the first to construct the count, we always need uh, some internal marked point. So let's add it. Uh, let's add infinite leg W to S at P at this, uh, the point we glue P. And then we count uh, this spine by evaluating at this point W. And after adding this infinite leg, now we can deform by stretching this point P and make appear two small uh, edges, E1 and E2. So this is a small deformation of this by stretching the point P. And now W is attached, the leg W is attached to the middle of this purple, uh, of the two new purple edges. And if we further stretch, if we further stretch uh, the, the two vertical edges, E1 and E2, 
to make them of infinite length and contains, contain a node. So we make each edge infinite length to contain a node. Then we arrive at the gluing situation of step one. And note that in this stretching process, all spines are transverse. <clears throat> so their counts do not change by deformation invariance. Uh, now we just conclude by the lemma we proved in step one, uh, we show and we conclude our proof for this equality. So this is the second step to establish the gluing formula. It's, uh, it uses the deformation invariance for transverse spines as well as uh, uh, the previous lemma that we established for the counts of uh, such a glued spine with this auxiliary uh, with this auxiliary spine delta in the middle. So finally, uh, in step three for the gluing formula, we are given two spines, S1, S2, in the essential skeleton of U, both transverse to wall, like this, S1, uh, S2. And assume we have finite one valent vertices, V1 in the domain, gamma one of S1 and the V2 in the domain gamma two of S2. Uh, such that uh, they map to the same point in the essential skeleton of U. And um, we assume that we have opposite derivatives, meaning that the derivative at uh, V1 of H1 plus the derivative at V2 of H2 is zero. Since they have opposite derivatives and they map to the same point in the essential skeleton of U, we can glue S1 and S2 along V1 and V2 and obtain a new transverse span S like this uh, in the essential skeleton. And here is the final uh, theorem, the final gluing formula. For any curve class gamma, we have the following equality, which says that uh, the count associated to this glued span S and any curve class gamma is equal to the sum of uh, all the over all the compositions of gamma into gamma one plus gamma two of uh, um, the count associated to the left part S1 uh, with curve class gamma one times the count associated to S2 and the curve class gamma two. So this is the final gluing formula and uh, uh, it is a generalization of uh, uh, the two-dimensional case in my previous paper, but here I'm presenting a more conceptual proof via deformation invariance. So the, the uh, idea of the proof is the following. Um, so we want to prove that uh, when we glue these two together, we have this uh, formula for the count. And uh, let's make a small ex extension of S1. This is our S1. We make a small extension of our S1 at V1 to S1 hat uh, by linearity. So we just uh, extend linearly at this uh, vertex V1, and extend a little bit. Uh, this uh, purple part is uh, our extension. And uh, similarly, we make a small extension of S2 at V2 by linearity to S2 hat. 
and by deformation invariance for this uh, transverse uh, truncated spines, the count uh, remain, remain the same. The counts do not change when we make these uh, small extensions as long as we do, do not meet walls. And now, after making the two small extensions, observe that uh, if we glue S1 hat and S2 hat together uh, by identifying V1 and V2, uh, so let's glue S1 hat and S2 hat together uh, at V1 and V2. We see that once we do that, uh, this gluing is actually just equal to the glued span S to the gluing of S with some small straight span L. Uh, so this gluing S1 hat S2 hat at V1 and V2, it's just, it's equal to the gluing of S, this red S together with this purple, purple edge L. Uh, at the point V. And both sides of this formula are gluing of two spines. So we can, so both sides are gluing of, are the situ, gluing situation of step two. So we can apply uh, step two to both sides of the above equality. And we obtain uh, this which says that uh, the sum over all decompositions of gamma into gamma one and gamma two of the count associated to the S1 hat uh, and the gamma one times the count associated to this extended span, this uh, small extension S2 hat and the gamma two is equal to the sum over all decompositions of gamma into beta one plus beta two of the count associated to S, this red S, uh, and the curve class beta one times the count associated to uh, the L, this purple uh, small straight span L and uh, curve class beta two. So uh, now we have to, let's compute explicitly the contribution. Uh, of uh, this part. So we can explicitly compute that uh, the count associated to L and the beta two is equal to one if beta two is zero and it's uh, equal to zero otherwise. And if we substitute, um, if we substitute uh, this explicit computation into the equality above, we obtain uh, the gluing formula in, in our theorem. Oh, oh sorry, do, yes. I, do I understand you have this purple interval L maps to a point, is essentially the only con contribution you have, yeah? L, L doesn't map to a point, L, map, L maps to a small interval. Ah, small interval, I see, yeah. Yeah, so it's really, yeah, it's not clear what is, does correspond to in symplectic topology because you don't consider P1s, but kind of like annular, yeah? It's, a, yeah, it's a very small annular mapping yeah. to a place without walls, I see. without yeah. any walls. I see, so, yeah. Yeah, so that place is like uh, just a torus. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have, a, it's like we count annulus just in an algebraic torus. Yeah, I see. So the count is uh, really the simplest yeah. Either one if curve class is zero or zero if it has a, if we put some non-trivial curve class. Mm -hmm. Because it it just maps to a place without walls, so yeah, there yeah. is nothing uh, interesting happening. Yeah, so uh via these three steps we obtain this gluing formula zero. And let me remark that similar idea can be applied to show that our counts are independent on the choice of the torus uh, when we impose the toric tail condition. 
Assume we have two torus embeddings, Tm in U and uh, Tm prime in U. Just two different uh, embeddings uh, leading to two different toric tail conditions, T and T prime. So recall that in the definition of our naive counts of skeletal curves, uh, in order to obtain a finite uh, dimensional moduli space, we need to impose some extra condition and uh, some extra regularity condition on the boundary via analytic continuation. And uh, that uh, condition called the toric tail condition was formulated according to the choice of some torus, torus embedding. Now, we want to show that it's independent of the torus embedding using the same idea in the proof of the gluing formula. So assume we have two torus embeddings, Tm in U and Tm prime in U, leading to two different toric tail conditions, curly T and curly T prime. And now we consider a spine S uh, like this, in the essential skeleton of U with a finite one valent vertex V. So here, the span S is the whole graph, including the purple part. This is our span S. It has a, a finite one valent vertex V. So we want to show that uh, the count of this span S uh, does not depend on which tail condition we impose at this uh, end V. For this, let's pick W, some point W very close to V, and let L denote the restriction of the span S to this small interval WV. So this purple uh, interval is just a restriction of S to a small uh, neighborhood of V. And then we pick uh, any point X in the middle of W and V, and we consider the gluing of S with L. So it's similar to the gluing we considered uh, a moment ago. Uh, here, when we consider gluing of S and L, uh, we get like this part gets doubled. It's like the double. Um, now, uh, by step two, above, we obtain the following equality. So here, you see that uh, we are gluing. Um, we are gluing uh, two spines at some interior point of edges, which is the situation of uh, step two. And, um, uh, and uh, so we can apply the formula in step two. And now uh, if we apply the formula in step two, we obtain the following. So the left hand side uh, yeah, so when we apply, we think like this. Um, for the, uh, the left hand side is the sum over all decompositions of gamma into beta plus delta of uh, the count associated to S uh, using the tail condition, the first tail condition T everywhere uh, times the count associated to L using the tail condition T prime at uh, V and the T at all uh, at uh, the other end of L. So this left hand side, so we can think of um, L as for the left hand side, we put uh, the toric tail condition T everywhere on S, but for L, 
we put the toric tail condition T at W, but the tail condition T prime at V. And then we apply the step two above to this gluing. Now for the right hand side, we just think that for the gluing we switch, uh, we switch uh, this part of L with this part of S, which means that uh, it's the sum over all decompositions of gamma into beta plus delta of the count associated to um, our span S, where we use tail condition T prime at V and T in all other places. Now, at times, the count associated to uh, this small interval L where we apply a tail condition T at both ends. So it's really, so the left hand side, as I said, the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side it's how we think of the gluing. It's like we are switching that half, half of L with that uh, last piece of S. So one, one piece is uh, has the toric tail condition T attached and the other piece has toric tail condition T prime attached. When we switch them uh, in this gluing, we obtain, and when we apply step two, we obtain this, uh, we obtain this formula, obtain this equality. So now it, it remains to compute explicitly the, uh, the, the contributions of uh, the small, this L piece. So we can compute uh, as before that the count associated to L using the tail condition T um, and the curve class delta is equal to one if delta is zero and if it, it's equal to zero for all other delta. And the, the same holds when we count uh, the small interval L um, using, toric, uh, using tail condition T prime at V and T at W, uh, the same equality, the same uh, count uh, works also for the other one. And we now we substitute, um, we substitute this explicit uh, computation into the equality above. We obtain the following theorem uh, for tail condition with varying torus. So we have proved by substituting this explicit computation into the equality, we have proved that the count associated to our spine S using tail condition T everywhere and, and for some fixed class gamma is equal to the count associated to the spine S um, equal to the count associated to the span S uh, using tail condition T prime at V and tail condition T everywhere else. Uh, these two counts are equal. So uh, here we are just uh, switching tail condition at one vertex. Then of course one can switch at all other vertices and we can even apply different toric tail conditions at all finite vertices. So this, uh, in other words, the theorem shows that the count of skeletal curves is independent, uh, is independent on the choice of uh, the torus TM inside U. So um, just a small remark concerning the computation for the count associated to this small interval where we put different toric tail conditions at both ends. So uh, the explicit computation for this count 
using two different tail conditions is a bit more subtle than for the count where we put the same tail conditions. Uh, we need to use a result concerning the gluing of uh, non-Archimedean polyannuli in my previous paper. Uh, if we put two different uh, con tail uh, conditions, because if we put the same tail condition, then the count is easy. It's like something, yes. No, so, sorry, you know, you're not, it's kind of, maybe you mean that on one part, half of interval area, you put condition T prime and another T, but your yes. notation, your, not, your notation don't say this, it's kind of like T, T prime everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, but actually it says that it's one end is T, the other end is T prime. I see. Yeah. So it's, it's clear I hope it that yeah. it's understandable. Okay. Otherwise the notation is a bit complicated. Yeah. Mm, yeah, so I'm saying that if uh, at both ends we put the same tail condition, then the count is easy to do because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, as, uh, yeah, as Maxim remarked, uh, it, it, we just map to a torus, so then it's just uh, counting something in the toric variety. But if we put uh, different uh, tails at uh, the two ends, then the counting is a bit more complicated because uh, it maps to some gluing of uh, gluing of two different torus. But uh, one can show that uh, actually uh, one can decompose uh, the automorphism of the some annulus into uh, two parts where one part can be extended can be extended to an automorphism of some disk times polyannulus, and another part can be extended to uh, automorphism of uh, another opposite disk times the annulus. So after applying this automorphism, we see that we are, we, we are back to the previous situation, just uh, counting something in uh, P1 times some uh, polyannulus the computation of uh, uh, automorphisms of uh, uh, this uh, automorphisms of the some aphenoid algebras. Yeah, so uh, this is the idea for the proof of the gluing formula and also for the proof of uh, changing tail condition. And uh, in fact, uh, this uh, proof of uh, changing tail condition uh, also works if we uh, eventually use uh, more general tail conditions without uh, using any uh, embedded tori. So, um, it's easier to carry out this proof uh, than one can imagine using like deformation invariance uh, for it feels a bit more complicated. Mm. <clears throat> so now uh, let's turn to the next section, uh, structure constants and the associativity of mirror algebra. Mm. We want to apply our gluing formula and all the other techniques we have developed so far uh, to study structure constants and the associativity of the mirror algebra. So let us recall the setting from the, pre, the first uh, lecture uh, where we have a log Calabi-Yau variety U containing some torus TM and uh, we have uh, some SNC compactification of U in Y. We have a monoid ring R uh, over this uh, effective uh, curve classes, uh, assembling all possible curve classes together. And the mirror algebra A, uh, it, is, uh, it has basis 
the integer points in the essential skeleton as an, an R module. So this was our setup in the first lecture. And again, recall that given some integer points in the skeleton, we write the product in the mirror algebra A as uh, this product of uh, the theta functions, theta p1 to theta pn in the mirror algebra A as uh, this sum. So first we sum over all integer points in the essential skeleton of the basis vector theta q, and then we sum over all uh, curve classes, over all effective curve classes um, of the basis element z to the gamma. It's just a notation for the basis elements. And we denote the coefficient by chi p1 to pn q gamma. And this chi is called the structure constants uh, of our mirror algebra A. And let's also recall uh, how it was defined in, uh, in the first lecture. So the structure constant uh, chi was defined as follows. We had, the, so first we figure out what was the class delta of the added toric tail. And we denote the total class beta to be gamma plus delta. Beta is supposed to be the class of the, uh, the closed P1 after the toric tail extension. We also had the Z uh, equal to the opposite of Q in the essential skeleton. And we had tuple PZ uh, putting P P1 to Pn and Z together. And we use this tuple PZ to specify uh, intersection numbers with the boundary. Then we considered the moduli space, this HPZ beta with marked points labeled as P1 to Pn Zs. So this is the moduli space of maps uh, of, of maps from P1 with marked points, P1 to Pn Zs. And we say that we specify the intersection of uh, the P1. Uh, so it's the modular space of maps of P1 into Y. And uh, we specify uh, the intersection numbers uh, at these marked points with uh, the boundary D using the tuple. Uh, PZ. And we had a natural map phi uh, from this moduli space to uh, here, taking domain, taking domain and the evaluation at the last marked point S. And we also had a special point Q tilde in the identification of the target um, which was given as a pair of mu and q. Uh, mu, we give mu, we just specify what was mu in the first factor, uh, corresponds to some divisorial evaluation, and q is just uh, um, the given q. So the given q is a integer point in the essential skeleton, in particular it's a point in uh, the identification of U. So we had this special point Q tilde. And then finally, we had a subspace F in the fiber of uh, the map phi over Q tilde, which is a finite analytic space. Uh, and if we take its length, uh, the length was by definition the structure constant chi. Uh, in the first lecture, first I gave uh, a, heuristic pic a heuristic picture uh, of uh, what we count 
for the structure constant about counting um, disks with some conditions on the derivative uh, of the disk at the boundary and uh, and and after that I uh, give a precise uh, construction of, of the structure constant in using algebraic using non-Archimedean geometry so this was uh, just a recall of what we did and the definition is uh, quite uh, straightforward uh, but let's remark the following. Due to the choice of this specific point Q tilde uh, inside the target, so we used this Q tilde to take fiber and then take subspace. Uh, due to the choice of this specific point, the curves in F responsible for structure constants although highly generic in the algebraic sense, are in fact very special. In other words, non-transverse from the tropical viewpoint. Because this special point, it's a generic point in the algebraic world, but it's a very non-generic point in the tropical world. So this results uh, very generic curves in the algebraic sense, but very special curves uh, from the tropical, in the tropical picture. And this was convenient for giving a quick definition of structure constants, but it's impractical for proving any properties about them. For example, associativity, finiteness, all these properties, they are out of reach uh, from this quick definition. Uh, we must deform the curves in F into more transverse positions by perturbing this special point Q tilde. Because when we want to prove properties, uh, for example, if we want to apply the gluing formula or deformation invariance, we, we usually need the assumption that the spine, uh, the spines are transverse. But if we do the count using this specific point Q tilde, we will not get uh, transverse spines. So we must perturb, uh, perturb these curves by varying the point Q tilde. Do we do it like this? A proposition. We label the marked points of metric trees in um, this moduli space. So this is a moduli space of uh, tropical curves, um, rational tropical curves with n plus one, n plus two legs. Here, abstract tropical curves are the same as metric trees. And we label the n plus two points, marked points as uh, P1 to Pn Zs. And let Vm in the modular space uh, be the subset consisting of metric trees whose Z lag and S lag are incident to a single three valent vertex. Here is the picture. We have such a metric tree. It has a lot of legs. By leg, we mean infinite one valent vertex. Or, yeah, so, or more precisely, we mean this, uh, ed the edges containing infinite one valent vertices. So here we consider the subset where the Z leg and the S leg, they are incident to a single three valent vertex. So the Z leg and the S leg, they meet first and before uh, before uh, the tree branches to other legs. Yeah, and uh, we observe that this VM is, uh, is a neighborhood of this special choice of the modulus mu. 
and next uh, next we want to figure out a neighborhood of this special point Q. So let's consider a polyhedral subdivision uh, sigma of the essential skeleton given by the set of walls in the essential skeleton. Here, we can assume the set of walls to be finite polyhedral by bounding the degree of twigs via the fixed curve class beta. So in general, uh, wall, the set of walls, they are infinitely many walls and it can be dense in the essential skeleton. But if we bound some degree, uh, we get a finite set of walls. So we consider the polyhedral subdivision induced by the set of walls. And we let VQ be the open star of the point Q in uh, sigma. In other words, the union of open cells in sigma whose closure contains Q. So we have Q and we have a polyhedral decomposition. We just take uh, like a cone around, around the point Q. Q might be, uh, Q might lie inside a wall, but it doesn't matter. We take the star uh, of Q in sigma then Q becomes an interior point in this open star. And we said that by construction, um, Q tilde, which was given as a pair mu Q, mu is an interior, VM is a neighborhood of mu, VQ is a neighborhood of, neighborhood of Q. So, Q tilde, so VM times VQ is a neighborhood of Q tilde inside the product of uh, the tropical moduli space and the essential skeleton. And uh, we already remarked uh, when we talk about essential skeletons that uh, using Temkin's metrization theory, one can show that product of uh, skeleton is uh, homeomorphic to skeleton of product and this uh, lies in the identification of the product. Yeah, so using this construction, we figure, we figure out uh, two natural neighborhood of, uh, sorry, we figure out a natural neighborhood of uh, the first factor of Q tilde and a natural neighborhood of the second factor of Q tilde. So we figure out a neighborhood of Q tilde. Mm, I recall that our goal is to perturb the point Q tilde. So we will be perturbing Q tilde inside this neighborhood Vm times Vq. And now let this be the pre-image of Vm times Vq by the map uh, phi analytic from this moduli space by taking domain and evaluation at the last mark point S. So before we took pre-image of a single point Q tilde, now we take pre-image of uh, this neighborhood of Q tilde. And now we take curly F to be the subset in the pre-image satisfying the toric tail condition. Then the preposition says that um, phi analytic is finite et al on the neighborhood of this subset and whose degree gives the structure constant. So this is how we perturb uh, the special point Q tilde into general position by allowing Q tilde to vary inside this neighborhood, Vm times Vq. And uh, we prove that uh, if we allow Q tilde to vary and uh, when we impose toric tail condition, then this map phi is still, is good. It's finite et al on the neighborhood of this uh, F. So the degree is well defined and it gives uh, the structure constant. Since it's finite et al, so we get a well-defined degree and the degree 
at the fiber over the point Q tilde, it was our quick definition of the structure constant. So here, uh, the structure constant is reinterpreted as some degree of finite et al map. And for its proof, we use uh, the toric tail proposition for almost the transverse spines because it, here it feels like deformation invariance that we are moving, uh, we are moving the spines for the structure constants uh, inside this conical neighborhood, but uh, they do not stay, it's not always uh, transverse. Sometimes it, it becomes non-transverse, especially at the point Q tilde, for example. But uh, we had developed this proposition in the last lecture, not just for transverse spines, but is that uh, it especially adapted to the situation here where we can go across the walls. So after this uh, perturbation into generic position, now we can prove the the following theorem. The multiplication rule given by the structure constants chi here is commutative and associative. Here is uh, the sketch of proof. Commutativity is obvious because the definition of the structure constant chi is symmetric with respect to the PIs. And associativity means that the product theta P1, theta P2 to theta Pn uh, does not change if we add arbitrary parentheses. So let us now sketch the proof of the following equality, where the left-hand side means we first take product of theta P1 and theta P2, and then we take product with theta P3, while the right-hand side means we take the product theta P1, theta P2, theta P3 together using the multiplication rule. So we want to prove uh, this uh, equality. And we just rewrite the products using the multiplication rule. Um, we substitute the multiplication rule into the equality. And we see that the equality becomes equivalent to the following equality. Uh, for every integer point Q in the essential skeleton and every curve class gamma. Mm. Now observe that the right hand side of the equality star is given by counts of skeletal curves associated to spines of this shape where we have three infinite legs with the derivatives p1, p2, p3 respectively and with and also we have one finite leg with the inward derivative q. So three infinite legs with outward derivative p1, p2, p3 and one finite leg with inward derivative q. And by the above proposition about perturbing uh, q tilde, we can deform the modulus uh, of the domain here by stretching this point. So we deform this point into a small uh, pass L and then we further stretch this pass L very, very long like this. So if we stretch the pass L very long, we see that uh, the point U near the top of the pass L will map sufficiently close to the ray zero R inside the essential skeleton of U. And we need it to be sufficiently close to the ray 
because we want it to lie inside the cone uh, VR in the essential skeleton of U in, as in the above proposition for the structure constant chi P1, P2, R eta. Recall that in our quick definition of structure constants, we say that uh, the marked point just go directly to the point Q tilde. And that was too uh, non-transverse, too rigid. Now we allow uh, Q tilde to move a little bit around, but we still, we always need it to be sufficiently close to the ray OQ. So it, it should not move outside across some walls around uh, this ray. Otherwise, it doesn't give the correct structure constant. So here, we stretch this pass L very long so that finally, uh, some point U near the top of the pass will be sufficiently close to the ray OR. Then, uh, then that will be good enough for defining the structure constant chi P1, P2, R eta. So we can cut at the cross U, apply the gluing formula and obtain the left hand side of the equality star. So similarly, uh, given two spines responsible for the product in the left hand of the equality star, we can glue them to form a highly stretched spine like this that is responsible for the right hand side. And this completes the proof of associativity. So um, before the break, let me quickly sketch uh, another important property of uh, our structure constants, uh, which is the convexity property. So here is the theorem of the convexity property. Let F be a Cartier divisor on Y and uh, consider, consider an analytic disk in general position responsible for the structure constant, um, for the structure constant chi P1 to Pn Q gamma. Then the following hold. First, uh, since F is a Cartier divisor, we can take its tropicalization and obtain a real valued function, F trop on the essential skeleton. Then, uh, first we have that the sum of F trop at over all uh, pi minus f trop at q is equal to the intersection number between f and gamma minus the degree of uh, f analytified restricted to the punctured disk, meaning the disk minus all the marked points. And the second, if f is an f and uh, minus f restricted to u is effective, then uh, we have f trop of q is less than or equal to the sum of f trop at every pi. And furthermore, assume f is ample and minus f restricted to u is effective, then the above equality, inequality is an equality if and only if uh, F maps the punctured disk into the torus. And the proof uh, uses uh, some detailed computation using uh, semi-stable models of curves. The convexity theorem implies the following finiteness result. Um, finiteness result one, given P1 
P1 to Pn in the essential skeleton of U, some integer points in the essential skeleton of U, then there are at most finitely many pairs Q gamma, where Q is an integer point in the essential skeleton of U, and the gamma is a curve class such that the structure constant is non-zero. Um, let me give a quick uh, proof of how the finiteness follows from the convexity. So since U is affine, we can find the regular functions x1 to xl on U such that the set of points in the essential skeleton uh, where the norm of xi at b is bounded by some real number c for all i, this set is, a, is bounded for any real number c. Now, um, if the structure constant is non-zero by the convexity statement 2, uh, we apply the convexity statement to the Cartier divisor given by these regular functions, we obtain this equality, the norm of uh, xi of the function xi at q is less than or equal to a uh, sum of uh, is less than or equal to sum over all uh, j of x, the norm of xi at pj. And this shows that given p1 to pn, there are at most finitely many q such that the structure constant is non-zero for some gamma. So this bounds q. And the next, let's bound the gamma. We want to bound both q and the gamma. And the assumption that u is affine implies that there is an ample divisor f on y such that minus f restricted to u is effective. And now we apply the convexity theorem 1, the statement 1, this statement, and we obtain this, the following, equal, the following equality and the inequality which says that the intersection number between f and the gamma is equal to the sum of f trop at every pi minus f trop at q plus the degree of the analytic f restricted to the punctured disk. And since minus f restricted to u is effective, uh, this degree is uh, non-positive. So we see that this is less than or equal to this. And this is fixed, the right-hand side. This bounds gamma by the ampleness of f. So this uh, is how we deduce the finiteness result from the convexity property. And the finiteness result uh, is important because it implies that the two sums in the multiplication rule uh, here, they are finite sums. So the multiplication rule gives an R algebra structure on the free R module A instead of just some formal algebra structure. And in fact, we have the following stronger finiteness result too, which says that the mirror algebra is a finitely generated R algebra. And for its proof, we need to resort to the equivariant boundary torus action on the mirror algebra. So here, due to time constraints, I will omit uh, this boundary torus action and uh, finite generation result in this lecture. And uh, after the break, I will explain uh, the application towards cluster algebras 
and also uh, I will explain the wall crossing, how to get uh, scattering diagrams using this kinds of analytic curves. So let's make five minutes break. Okay, thank you. So here is the plan for the last part of this lecture. Um, first, I will explain how to construct a scattering diagram via infinitesimal analytic cylinders. And the second, I will prove uh, the property of uh, theta function consistency for the scattering diagram. And third, we will set all curve classes to zero so that we no longer care about the compactification. And the fourth, I will explain the class, we will apply the above to the case of cluster algebras where I need to introduce uh, two new notions, uh, C twigs and C walls, especially for the cluster case. And uh, finally, I'll explain the comparison with the work of uh, Gross, Hacking, Kio, Kondosevich on the uh, for cluster with the work of Gross, Hacking, Kio, Kondosevich for cluster algebras. So let's start with uh, first scattering diagram via infinitesimal analytic cylinders. Both in the, yes. Um, both in the original suggestions by Kondosevich Soboma and in the gross Siebert program, the construction of mirror variety relies on the combinatorial algorithmic construction of scattering diagram, also known as wall crossing structure. Our construction, um, our construction of the mirror algebra by counting non-Archimedean analytic disks, as in the previous lectures, completely bypasses any use of scattering diagram. Nevertheless, our geometric approach also allows us to give a direct construction of the scattering diagram by counting infinitesimal analytic cylinders without the step-by-step kondosevich soberman algorithm. And this has three implications. First, it gives a geometric interpretation of the combinatorial scattering diagram. Second, conversely, we obtain a combinatorial way for computing the non-Archimedean the non curve counts. And the third, it paves the way for the comparison with the work of Gross, Hacking, Kio, Kondosevich on cluster algebras. Let me also remark that there are recent works of Argus Gross, Gross, Siebert, gave um, another geometric interpretation of scattering diagram based on the theory of punctured log curves de developed by Abramovich, Chen, Gross, and Siebert. Now let us sketch uh, our construction of the scattering diagram via infinitesimal analytic cylinders. Recall we have our log calabial U containing some torus TM and is contained in some SNC compactification Y. And we denote uh, by N the dual of M. So definition, given a hyperplane and perp in MR, M tensor with R, and any generic point X in the hyperplane M perp. Generic means that it's not contained in any other uh, N perp. It's only contained in this one hyperplane. And say we are given two vectors, V and W in M uh, minus N perp and the curve class alpha. Let V, X, V, W be the infinitesimal spine 
here, bending at x with incoming direction w and outgoing direction v. And this gives rise to the associated count of analytic curves n v alpha. So we consider this infinitesimal spine bending once at a generic point x in the hyperplane and perp with specified incoming and outgoing direction and we consider the associated count of analytic curves. Then using all these counts for any x in some hyper for any generic point x in some hyperplane and perp we define the following wall crossing transformation. Psi xn acts on uh, the basis uh, vector z to the v as follows. If we, uh, if, so for all v in m, which pairs with n positively, we define uh, the value of uh, psi xn at z to the v to be the sum over all possible vector of all vectors uh, of every vector w in m which pairs with n positively and over all curve class of the basis vector z alpha zw uh, with coefficient the count we just defined. So in other words, we just sum over all possible incoming direction w and all possible curve class. And if uh, uh, for all v in m, which pairs with n uh, trivially, which lies in the hyperplane, we just defined it to be z to the v. It doesn't, the wall crossing transformation does nothing for this v. And unlike in the multiplication rule, this sum does not, uh, is not a finite sum. But this converges in the natural eddy topology, which we describe uh, here. Um, since this cone of curves may not be polyhedral, we fix a strictly convex toric monoid Q containing uh, this effective curve classes. And let R hat be the completion of the monoid ring over Q direct sum M with respect to the maximal monomial ideal I. In other words, the ideal generated by monomials Z Q Z M with Q non-zero and arbitrary M. So we use this completion uh, to express the convergence. Lemma, uh, convergence lemma, the formal sum in the wall crossing transformation lies in our head. So the reason is that uh, when we give bound on curve classes, it implies bound on the combinatorial types of the two x uh, of all analytical curves contributing to these counts. And this in turn gives a bound on the incoming directions w. So now uh, by linearity over this monoid ring, we can extend the wall crossing transformation, transformation to a map from uh, the monoid ring over all curve classes plus direct sum with the subset of the lattice M which pairs with M non-negatively and uh, the map goes to R hat. We just, uh, here we defined what it does on the basis vectors and we extend it by linearity uh, over 
the monoid ring. Theorem, um, wall crossing homomorphism theorem. The map psi xn is a ring homomorphism. So it means that if we pick arbitrary m1, m2 in m that pairs with n non-negatively, we want to show that we have a psi applied to z to the power m1 plus m2 is equal to psi of z to the m1 times psi to the z of m2. It's, it's what means uh, for the map to be a ring homomorphism. So let's uh, prove, try to prove this. We, let's fix any vector E in M and any curve class alpha, and let's prove the equality of the coefficients of Z alpha Z E inside uh, the formula above. Note that it's obvious, the equality is obvious when both M1 and M2 lies in N perp. Because if they lie, M, they lie in M perp, then the wall crossing transformation does nothing on them. So we may assume that one of them pairs with N positively. So assume that the pairing between N and M1 is positive and the pairing between N and M2 is uh, non-strictly positive. And we consider the count of analytic pair of pants associated to these spines with three, just very infinitesimal spine with three legs, with three ends near X with directions uh, M1, M2 minus E at the three ends. So uh, claim, suppose X uh, is contained in the wall sigma. Then the count of analytic pair of pants is independent of which side of sigma, the three valent vertex of uh, this, our spine maps to. Here, the left picture shows um, this spine uh, mapping to the essential skeleton uh, and this uh, blue uh, blue line is a wall and the left picture shows uh, the situation where the three valent vertex maps to the left the three valent vertex maps to the left and the right picture shows the situation where the three valent vertex maps to the right. So the claim says that the count is independent uh, of which side the three valent vertex go. Um, let's further observe that in the left picture, when we specify the directions M1, M2, and E, um, this, the shape of the spine is unique, which we denote by SL, because there is only one possible band, and that band is determined by the three uh, directions at the ends. However, in the right picture, the shape of the spine is not unique, because we have two bands, and this band when we deform from left to right, this band is decomposed into two bands and uh, all possible ways of decomposition are allowed. So for the right hand picture, we are actually summing over many, we are summing over many different shapes of uh, spines, which we denote by SRI. Sorry, Tony. Yeah, yes. there's also a possibility that when M2 is parallel to the wall, which is... In yes, the yes. Row, this yeah. is the trickiest, uh, uh, this is the trickiest possibility. But I allow M2 to be 
parallel to the wall here. Uh, what is your doubt? Where is your doubt? No doubt, no, no. no. It's allowed. Yeah, yeah, no. It just... yeah, and it's exactly the possibility where M2 is parallel to the wall, that possibility implies uh, that uh, like the per that the preservation of volume elements. I see. So yeah, so we keep in mind that we also have the possibility M2 parallel to the wall. Yeah, so as Maxime remarked that uh, uh, here in the proof, we use the proposition for toric, uh, for tail conditions in families in the last lecture. And the trickiest case is when one of uh, M1 or M2 uh, lies in M perp. One of them is parallel to the wall, where we need to use the deformation invariance for almost transverse spans. So now let's uh, go back to the proof of the theorem. Uh, this is proof for the claim about deformation invariance when we move from left to right. And now let's back to the proof of the wall crossing homeomorphism theorem. Note that for any span L disjoint from walls, the count N L gamma is one if gamma is zero and is zero otherwise. Because if it's disjoint from walls, we are essentially in the toric situation and everything can be computed explicitly. Keeping this in mind, now we consider first the left picture. If we cut the spine SL at the cross by the gluing formula, then by the gluing formula, the count uh, associated to S alpha, uh, SL, this red spine SL, and any curve class alpha gives the coefficient of uh, Z alpha ZE in this wall crossing transformation because when we cut at this cross, the left part uh, is disjoint from wall. So it doesn't contribute. While the right part has a bend and the right part is exactly the infinitesimal cylinders that we use in the definition of the wall crossing formula. So therefore, when we count uh, analytic curves associated to SL, we get the coefficient in this wall crossing transformation. And the next, if we cut, next let's consider the right picture where the three valent vertex maps to the right. If we cut the spine SRI at the two crosses by the then by the gluing formula, uh, so we cut at these two places. Now the spine is broken into three pieces. Note that the right piece uh, is disjoint from any walls. So the right piece doesn't contribute, but the two left pieces, they both contribute and they both have a a band, and we just uh, add their contributions together. So by the gluing formula, we see that the count associated to this, uh, the count associated to this spine SRI is equal to the sum over all decompositions of curve class alpha into alpha one plus alpha two of the count associated to this upper left spine times the count associated to the lower left part. And we remarked that when the three valent vertex maps to the right of the wall, uh, we have different shapes parametrized by I. And the next, we sum over all possible shapes SRI 
and we see that the sum of counts associated to SRI gives exactly the coefficient of Z alpha ZE inside the product of the two wall crossing transformations. So we conclude the proof uh, of wall crossing homomorphism by the claim. Mm, yeah, so this uh, shows that wall crossing transformation is a ring homomorphism. And we remark that the immediate consequence of the ring homomorphism is the following. Given any x uh, generic, any generic x in some hyperplane n perp, and any vector v in m, which whose pairing with n equals one. So in particular, this means that n is necessarily a primitive vector. Uh, we re just rewrite uh, psi xn at zv to be zv times some function. This is just a rewriting uh, with some function in r hat. Then uh, the fact that wall crossing is a ring homomorphism implies that the function f x and v does not depend on v. And geometrically, this means that the count of infinitesimal analytic cylinders uh, depends only on the amount of band independent of uh, incoming or outgoing direction. So for the count of this, we can change uh, incoming or outgoing direction as long as we have the same amount of band, we always have the same count. Uh, in particular, this implies that the wall crossing transformation preserves the standard volume form on tori. And moreover, we have f. Uh, we have we have the equality between the function f x and v and f x minus n v. Uh, in other words, it's independent of the orientation of wall. The function is independent of uh, orientation of wall. So we can denote uh, f x. So we can denote f x and v just by f x since it's uh, independent of n and also of v for any choice of n primitive uh, whose perp contains containing x and any choice of v uh, with uh, and the pairing between n v equals one and we call uh, f x the wall crossing function attached to x So here is the conclusion. Now we can write the wall crossing transformation applied to uh, ZV simply as ZV times FX to the power the pairing between N and V for any uh, for any vector V in M that pairs with n non-negatively and uh, this is uh, that resembles uh, like uh, to the more classical wall crossing mm, formula and uh, using this formula we see that uh, the wall crossing transformation psi xn extends to an automorphism of the fraction field of r hat um, let me remark that uh, this may not give an automorphism of r hat since the wall crossing function need not be invertible in r hat because of curve classes. It might not start with one, it might just start with a curve class and that curve class doesn't, is not invertible. Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, first this is just uh, how it is if we take into account curve classes. Uh, 
and it will become invertible when we set all curve classes to zero. Oh, definition. Now we have all the wall crossing transformations, wall crossing functions. We can define what is our scattering diagram. So let D be the set of pairs X, F, X, where X is any generic point in M perp, in the hyperplane N perp for any non zero N and fx is the associated wall crossing function. We call this set of pairs, x, fx, we call it the, the scattering diagram associated to u with respect to the compactification y and also with respect to the torus tm. So scattering diagram depends on the torus. And we remark that by the eddic convergence of fx of the wall crossing function, if we mod uh, ik, where i was, uh, if we mod out some power of i, where i was the maximum monomial ideal, then we obtain a finite scattering diagram dk. In other words, finite means that uh, we will only have finitely many polyhedral walls in DK. Here in D, we have infinitely many walls, so it no longer makes sense to say the shape of each wall. They are so small, it, it's better just to give the wall crossing functions attached to each generic point. But once we mod out some power of the maximum monomial ideal, we get finite scattering diagrams, dk, with finitely many polyhedral walls, and we call dk the case or the approximation of d. Mm. And one important property for scattering diagram is the consistency, consistency property. So let's uh, uh, try to establish consistency. Mm. First, let us establish a variant of a consistency property call, which we call theta function consistency. We introduce a new definition. Uh, choose any generic point x in MR and the two vectors ME in M. And let SP x ME be the set of spines in MR with domain uh, minus infinite, infinity to zero uh, like this, such that minus infinity maps to the boundary with derivative minus M and zero maps to X with derivative minus E. So we consider the set of all such red spines uh, starting from infinity, ending at x, with with the uh, directions m and e at the two ends, and uh, this is related to the notion of broken line in GHKK. We define the local theta function theta x m to be the formal sum. Uh, over all vector E and all such red spines S and all curve class uh, of the vector Z alpha, the basis vector Z alpha Z E and with the coefficient, the count associated to the, the red spine S and alpha. And again, we have eddic convergence. This lives in R hat. And we have the following theta uh, function consistency theorem. The scattering diagram D uh, is theta function consistent in the following sense. Given any 
uh, k, we consider the case order approximation. Give me any k, we consider the case order approximation of our uh, scattering diagram, dk, and we take a polyhedral wall, sigma, with attached wall crossing function f sigma inside dk. And we choose uh, a vector n such that the wall is contained in the hyperplane n perp. And we consider two points, A and B, two general points near another general point X in the wall uh, on two sides of the wall. So we pick a general point X in the wall and two general points on two sides of the wall, A and B near X, such that N a pairs with n positively and b pairs with n negatively. Then we have the following. If we apply the wall crossing transformation psi uh, to the local theta function at a uh, with uh, infinite direction m, we obtain the local theta function at b with the same infinite direction. And conversely, if we apply the wall crossing transformation psi with respect to the opposite orientation of the wall uh, to the local theta function theta bm, then we get back the local theta function theta am. This is uh, what we call the theta function consistency property. And uh, we use the gluing formula and the deformation invariance for the proof. So uh, our next step is to forget all curve classes. We want to get uh, closer to the classical wall crossing uh, structure or classical scattering diagram without uh, always thinking about curve classes in our compactification. So let's set all curve classes to zero. As I said, our wall crossing transformation and the scattering diagram depends on the, on the compactification u inside y via the usage of curve classes in y. So this is a more refined information but we can remove this dependence by setting all curve classes to zero. In order to have etic convergence, if we set all curve classes to zero, we need to impose a condition on the band of infinitesimal analytic cylinders. Without extra condition, we will lose etic convergence if we forget the curve classes. The assumption is the following. For any, uh, for any non-zero count associated to some infinitesimal spine at x with the uh, incoming direction, outgoing directions v and w, if the count is non-zero, then the band w minus v lies in the strictly convex monoid p uh, inside the m. We need this assumption in order to have etic convergence when, when we forget curve classes. So, uh, and here is the new etic convergence we consider uh, thanks to the monoid M. We consider J, the maximum monoidal ideal uh, in the monoid ring over P, the monoid P and let uh, L not hat be the geodetic completion of ZP. And finally, let L hat be L not hat tensor with ZM over ZP. In other words, we are taking completion of ZM 
in the direction of uh, the strictly convex monoid P. We allow infinite sums in the P direction and only finite sums in the other direction, in all other directions. So for now, we will be forgetting curved classes. Proposition, under the quotient from the monoid ring associated to Q direct sum P to the monoid ring associated to P, when we ignore all curve classes, the wall crossing functions fx in R, <clears throat> they map to uh, the quotient wall crossing functions fx bar in L hat, <clears throat> meaning that when we ignore curve classes, they have eddic convergence in L hat. And the, the wall crossing transformations, Psi xn, which used to be an automorphism of the fraction field of R hat, they become automorphisms of L hat. So we no longer need to take fraction field of L hat because when we forget the curve classes, the wall crossing transformations will automatically become uh, invertible. And furthermore, the local theta functions in R hat, they map to the quotient theta functions in L hat. So we have this j convergence for all these uh, things before and moreover, uh, we get the invertibility of the wall crossing transformation. So now we denote du uh, to be the set of pairs x fx bar, where x is any generic point in any uh, hyperplane n perp, and the fx bar is the associated uh, wall crossing function ignoring all curve classes. And we call this the scattering diagram associated to uh, u with, with respect to the torus Tm. Now we have uh, the following uh, consistency result which says that the scattering diagram du is consistent in the sense of kondasevich soboman In other words, for any general loop inside the MR, the composition of wall crossing automorphisms after ignoring curve classes along the loop is just the identity. So for the proof, uh, we observe that the subring of L hat generated by all local theta functions is geodically dense. And then the theorem follows from the theta function consistency. So that's uh, the general constructions of the scattering diagram uh, using counts of uh, infinitesimal analytic cylinders. And now let us apply our constructions above to the case of cluster algebras. Now here is the cluster data. We have lattice M with an integer valued skew symmetric form. And we have S prime, a basis of M and S inside S prime, a subset of S prime. This gives a seed for a skew symmetric cluster algebra of geometric type, where S corresponds to unfrozen variables and S prime minus S corresponds to frozen variables. And the seed gives rise to curly A a Fock-Gontroff A-type cluster variety. 
which is the gluing of tori via cluster mutations. And we let A up B the algebra of global functions on A called the upper cluster algebra. Let us assume that the skew symmetric form is unimodular. Um, we assume this for mainly for convenience, partially for convenience, uh, this holds in the principal coefficient case because this holds in the principal coefficient case and we will deduce more general cases from the principal coefficient case. And we also assume that the spec of the upper cluster algebra, which we denote by U, is smooth. So for example, double Bruja cells in semi-simple complex, complex Lie groups satisfy this smoothness assumption. I think it's possible to extend our work also to cover the non-smooth case without too much extra effort, but I haven't checked all the details. Mm. Then U is a log Calabria uh, containing a torus TM, so we can apply our theory to U and obtain a mirror algebra as well as a canonical scattering diagram by counting non-Archimedean analytic curves. And here is the question, how shall we compare with the constructions in the paper of Gross, Hacking, Kio, Kondosevich? The idea is the following. Um, in GHKK, the mirror algebra is built from the scattering diagram. And the scattering diagram is built by specifying the initial walls and using the kondosevich soberman algorithm. Therefore, for comparison with GHKK, by the uniqueness property of the kondosevich soberman algorithm, it suffices to compare the set of incoming walls. However, we have defined walls simply as images of twigs of tropical curves, and we do not have a notion of uh, incoming or outgoing walls in this generality. Therefore, here in the cluster case, we need to introduce a more restrictive notion of twigs and walls, which will allow us to distinguish incoming versus outgoing walls and to better control the monomials in the scattering functions. We will call them C twigs and C walls, where C stands for cluster. So a C twig is a twig such that each infinite leg maps to a hyperplane E perp with derivative uh, some multiple of E for some E in this basis corresponding to unfrozen variables. It's easy to see that for all stable map in the moduli space M smooth that we are interested in, <clears throat> the twigs of the tropical curve associated to such stable map, they are all C twigs in the cluster case. And the next, we define a C wall <clears throat> to be a pair sigma n, where n lies in P, the submonoid of M generated by S, and the sigma in the hyperplane M perp is a closed convex rational polyhedral cone. A C wall is called incoming if n lies in sigma and is called outgoing uh, otherwise. So C wall has a little bit more refined information of this direction vector n. And now 
we can construct a collection of seawalls by induction. So we start with W0, the collection of seawalls of form E perp uh, N, where E is any basis uh, vector corresponding to unfrozen variable and n is any positive multiple of e. We call these the initial c walls. And then by induction, we define, assume we already have w0 until wt, and we define wt plus one as follows. For all pairs, uh, for two C walls, all pairs of C walls in WT, such that either the pairing of the two direction vectors is non-zero or the direction vectors are parallel. We define the sum of the C walls of the two C walls like this, where the support of uh, the wall is uh, sigma one intersect sigma two minus all positive multiples of n one plus n two, and the direction of the C wall is just n one plus n two. We check that it is a C wall, and we add all such sums to W t, and finally we let W be uh, the union of all W t. So here it's important that we do not add walls when uh, the two direction vectors has pairing zero, but they are non-parallel because this corresponds to a non-transverse situation. So two consequences of the construction uh, are the following. First, the incoming C walls of W are exactly the initial C walls. And the second, for any generic C twig and any edge, there is always some C wall in our collection W such that the image of the edge lies in the support of the C wall and the derivative is equal to the direction of the C wall. And we remark that for the scattering diagram associated to you, the second consequence implies that uh, the wall crossing function always has the form, uh, has this form, where the exponent is just multiples of uh, uh, this n whose perp contains x. So a priori, the exponents can be quite arbitrary, but from our, the notions of C twigs and the C walls, we see that we have a strong restriction on the uh, shape of the scattering functions. Now we are ready to deduce the comparison with GHKK. So let DGHKK be the scattering diagram in GHKK. It is produced by the kondasevich stoberman algorithm from the set of initial walls, E perp, with a scattering function one plus Z to the E for all E, for all basis vector E corresponding to the unfrozen variables. Therefore, by the uniqueness property of the kondasevich soberman algorithm and by the identification of incoming C walls in our setting just above, it remains to show that our C walls have the same wall crossing functions. And 
uh, in other words, it's enough to show the following claim that for each E in S and for any point X in E perp generic, uh, the attached uh, scattering function for getting curve classes is just one plus Z to the E. And that can be done by um, first figuring out what uh, do the twigs look like and then by an explicit computation. So from this, we deduce immediately uh, the e comparison theorem for the scattering diagrams uh, between our scattering diagram and the GHKK scattering diagram. And uh, then we have um, the comparison theorem in the both uh, A cluster case and also the X cluster case. So uh, let us recall that in the first lecture, I mentioned the five consequences of the comparison theorem. Um, roughly, the comparison theorem gives uh, geometric interpretations of uh, and also more conceptual understandings of uh, many constructions in GHKK and also proves uh, some of their conjectures. Um, since I don't have much time uh, for in the first lecture, I mentioned another application of our theory to the study of uh, moduli spaces of Calabial pairs. So probably I can explain it in some other occasions. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Rush, for your lectures. And um, maybe can, some people want to ask some questions. Just please just unmute yourself and ask questions. Okay. Yeah, no, for me, the last part was very familiar, so I don't really have so questions. It's too easy. Yeah. Mm. Maybe it's a general question. It's, uh, in a situation we don't have uh, nice assumptions about affiness. When we don't have affiness, uh, we, the mirror algebra is not an algebra. Yeah. It's just uh, formal. For, well, but still, uh, yeah, it's still, for, it's still algebra of some form of series. And, yeah, so, yeah. Yes. So probably you want it to be some affinoid algebra. Yeah. Um, yeah, without a fine, but in any case, we need some positivity assumption. Yeah. Because as we have seen in the proof of the deformation invariance, we want to prevent bubbles moving from the interior to the boundary. Because if, so we want to count analytic disks in in the log Calabial variety U, we want we don't want to count analytic disks that has something to do with the boundary. Yeah, listen, yeah. And if we don't have any affinities or other sort of positivity assumption, then we cannot count analytic disks in U because uh, it can have bubbles or it can uh, deform and uh, touch the boundary. So I guess uh, in order to be able to count analytic disks, we need at least that the log Calabial to be proper over some affine. Yeah, you need some kind of semi-positivity of the boundary. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's actually very... Proper over affine. Yeah, proper affine, it's sufficient. Yeah, but maybe it's... <laughs> it's... But the proper over affine, is equivalent to the condition that we have uh, some uh, positive 
we have some positive combination of boundary components, which is NAV. Yeah. But they feel good conditions. If they both, both conditions, they are equivalent. And I think it's... Yeah, yeah also such kind of varieties appears in JT theory, usually JT you, you produce. I think that's a satisfactory setting yeah. uh, to assume proper over affine. It projective. also covers, oh, projective, projective or affine, maybe. Yeah. yeah, and it also covers just the projective case over a yeah. point. Yeah. Okay, so if there is no more questions, then we can virtually thank Tony for the nice series of lectures and uh, thank you, Maxine. Thank you. Okay, and, and thank uh, you, everyone, for your attentions. <laughs>